Hello and thank you for joining us on this election day here in Korea. In less than five minutes, thousands of polling stations across the country will close as voting ends at six o'clock sharp. The election could greatly impact the rules affecting the lives of people in Korea for the next four years, as well as reshape the nation's political landscape for both the ruling and opposition parties. With the Yoon song yeol administration in its third year in office and the main opposition party hoping to retain its parliamentary majority. Also, new third parties joining the race for the 300 parliamentary seats are bringing attention to this high stakes election. We are going to delve into all of that. And for that, joining us is Mason Ritchie, professor at Hanguk University of Foreign Studies and Arirang's political correspondent, Kim do -yeon. Welcome to you both. Good to be here. Great, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Uh, do -yeon, first, uh, walk, walk us through the recent polls. Right, building up to today's surveys until it was allowed, it kind of favored the main opposition Democratic Party with it retaining, like you said, the uh, majority. But when it comes to party approval ratings, in a national barometer survey done by the Embry Public Case Stat Research, Korea Research, and Hangul Research, the ruling People Power Party had 39% in favor, while the opposition parties DP and Rebuilding Korea Party had 29 and 10, respectively. The survey was conducted by metrics on 1,004 adults aged 18 and older from April 1st through April 3rd. The results had a margin of error or pl of plus or minus 3.1 percentage points at a 95% confidence level. Now, but I do want to say this is a general assembly election, so it doesn't mean that the national assembly will be split in half. But this is just a way of seeing who favor, who's pa which party um, shows more support. Mm -hmm, right. And there we're getting live pictures from the National Assembly where situation rooms are set up uh, by each and every political party, actually five parties. There you see the main opposition Democratic Party, the ruling People Power Party, uh, Green Justice Party, New Reform Party and Rebuilding Korea Party. Party leaders and executives look rather nervous waiting for the exit poll results. Meanwhile, as we wait for that, Professor Ritchie, how might the election results impact foreign policy or policies on North Korea for the next four years? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so in the first place, uh, a lot really depends uh, on this election in terms of uh, what President Yoon is going to be able to do going forward and what it is that he's going to focus on. So if the People Power Party um, you know, manages to get some type of workable majority uh, in the National Assembly, uh, one could imagine that, among other things, Yoon is finally going to be able to focus more on domestic issues than he's been able to do until now, when essentially he's been uh, working with uh, a hostile uh, uh, Democratic Party in the National Assembly, uh, which is antithetical to many of the positions that Yoon and his party would like to take. Uh, and because the opposition has a supermajority in the National Assembly, it's been very difficult for Yoon to push through uh, on his domestic priorities. That's meant, of course, that he's been able to focus much more on foreign policy, including building up relations with the United United States, uh, building up relations uh, with uh, uh, with Japan, uh, in increasing outreach to Southeast Asia, to Europe. Uh, you know, he's had much more a much broader uh, uh, foreign policy portfolio, in part because that's what he was able to focus on. Uh, if uh, the People Power Party manages to get a majority, of course, some of his attention, perhaps even a lot of his attention is going to be now focused much more on domestic policy. Of course, I don't imagine that his foreign policy would necessarily change, but perhaps there would be less of a push from the president in some areas, particularly perhaps some caution uh, about some of the policies uh, in the foreign policy space that he might take because he wouldn't want to jeopardize some of his domestic uh, related issues. On the other hand, if the Democratic Party uh, remains in power and has a majority, and con especially if it uh, continues to have a supermajority uh, and manages to block going forward uh, the UN uh, government's position, it's going to be, I think, an interesting question yeah. how much his lame duck status affects mm. his ability to push forward on foreign policy. He's obviously going to want to right. do that, but he'll have to pay attention to uh, the future of the party in 2027 with the presidential election coming up as well. Uh huh. And there we have the na nation's two major parties on the screen. Uh, you see, for the main opposition DP, there is uh, party leader Lee Jae Myung also. As for the ruling PPP, the, its interim leader Han Dong Moon is there. Um, I believe the exit poll results are expected to come out in less than uh, five seconds. Right, uh, first we're getting their reactions. Uh,
it looks like the exit poll results are in and we hear a round of applause from the DP and a moment of silence coming from the PPP uh, based on that reaction. It looks like the DP secured a majority, but of course we will be closely following the actual results all throughout the night. Right, uh, Professor Richie, based on the reaction that we see over there, how do you feel about tonight's election results? Well, certainly um, based off of uh, what we're seeing right now, it uh -huh. looks like uh, there's going to be a lot of unhappy people. Uh, the, the People Power uh, Party headquarters, there's going to mm. be a lot of uh, unhappy members of the party. Uh, there's going to be a lot of unhappy people uh, in the Yongsan uh, mm. presidential office. Mm. Uh, and you know, if if this results you know holds, and it looks like the the Democratic Party manages to have a majority, mm -hmm. uh, this is not only going to uh, perhaps push, in fact, likely push uh, President Yoon into lame duck status earlier than he otherwise uh, would be, and will diminish his influence within the party going forward. Uh, but it will probably also uh, hurt Han Dong-hoon as well. Um, you know, mm -hmm. one would think, of course, that as you know, even though he's become this the star, so to speak, within the party mm -hmm. recently, uh, that this might uh, hurt him as well uh, mm -hmm. going forward. Or at least it'll be harder for him to to place himself on the chessboard uh, within the party uh, for uh, the 2027 presidential election, where he did choose to want to do that. He hasn't, of course, said that he wants to do that publicly. Uh, so you know, not only do we, you know, I think look at these results and, and think that they're going to have a result in terms of the legislative process here. Uh, and on the, the foreign po the pro policy priorities, both foreign and domestic, uh, uh, here in Korea, um, but also, uh, you know, looking forward to the election in 2027. This uh, election tonight is going to cast quite a shadow. Right. Uh, of course, we will be discussing in detail about the exit polls a little later after the break uh, at 6.30 p.m. Korea time. But first, let's take a look at uh, how voters in Korea showed their passion for democracy and exercised their right to vote. Our Moon hye was on the site at one of the polling stations. Voting kicked off at over 14,000 different polling stations around the country, such as the one behind me, for people to cast their votes in this year's parliamentary elections. A steady stream of people headed to polling stations on Wednesday to cast their ballots for a new 300-member National Assembly. And at these polling stations, some differences between the last general election in 2020 and the general election this year could be seen. This year, the ballot paper for proportional representation seats is 51.7 centimeters long, with 38 parties running, making it the longest ever used in Korea. It's longer than the last parliamentary election in 2020, when the ballot paper was over 48 centimeters long, with 35 parties running. The voters this year were also a little different from the previous general election four years ago, due to the country's aging population. It's the first time ever that the number of voters above the age of 60 has surpassed that of those in their 20s and 30s, and pundits are dubbing this year's general election a grey election. According to the National Election Commission, those in their 20s and 30s made up just over 28 percent of voters, while those aged over 60 years old accounted for nearly 32 percent. But voters young and old all spoke of their hopes that led them to place their votes, with some coming to vote for the first time and some having voted in several previous general elections. What I and the rest of the country wants is a prosperous country with people who are happy and treated equally. It's my first time voting, so I did a lot of research before placing my vote. As someone who's part of the younger generation going to university, I'd like for politicians to listen to our needs and improve the job market. These voters are hoping their voices will be heard. Moon hye Arirang News. Thank you. 
국민 모두를 이제 위한 기회가 되었으면 좋겠습니다. 대도시가 아닌 지역에 어, 거주하는 제 국민들은 투표 하나를 하기 위해서 큰돈 혹은 시간을 써서 그 투표소에 가서 이제 투표를 해야 하는 보충이 있습니다. 투표소가 더 많이 많은, 만들어졌으면 좋겠다라는 생각을 하고 어, 또한 제 국민이 투표를 하려면 사전 신청을 해야 되는데 이러한 면들이 더 많이 홍보가 되었으면 좋겠습니다. 한국에서 합법적으로 외국인 근로자로 취업할 수 있는 법적 근거를 만들어 주시면 좋겠습니다. 또한 이주 여성들이 조금 더 전문적인 일자리에 예를 들어 심리상담사, 이주 여성 동료 심리상담사 같은 일자리에 진출할 수 있는 기반을 만들어 주시면 좋겠습니다. This is expected to take place at around 7 p.m. according to the NEC. The staff will then unfold the ballots and manually sort them into the proportional representation and district ballots. These will then be passed to the tables next to them where the district ballots will be fed into the ballot sorting machines. And this year there is an additional step where the ballots will then be double checked by hand for the first time in nearly 30 years to ensure that the sorting has been done correctly. And the proportional ballots will be sorted by hand just like they were in the previous election because they're once again too long for the machines. They're the longest ever at 51.7 centimeters due to the record 38 political parties on the ballot. The NEC said the newly added step is likely to add around two hours to the process compared to the last general election. The NEC predicts that this means that it will be around 4 a.m. when the vote counting for the constituencies is completed and around 6 a.m. for the proportional representation seats. So basically it's going to be a long night for all of us, but that's all I have for now. But I'll be back with more updates for in our later uh, newscast. Back to you, Chung. All right, that was our Lee Soo-jin live from one of the counting stations in Seoul. Thank you. The foreign media have also been keeping a close eye on South Korea's parliamentary elections as multiple outlets say the election will set the tone for the rest of the president's term. Choi Min Jung reports. South Korea's parliamentary elections have received a great deal of attention beyond its borders. Foreign media outlets highlighted that Wednesday's election is a crucial test for President Yoon suk yeol the Associated Press reported that the election would determine whether Yoon becomes a lame duck for his remaining three years in office. An expert told the AP that Yoon, who has been grappling with low approval ratings, will find it difficult to move forward even a single step on state affairs if his party loses the election. Another expert told Reuters that this election will be a retrospective of the president's performance rather than a choice about future policy issues. Several foreign media outlets, including The Guardian, highlighted what's been dubbed as the Green Onion outcry, which ignited voter anger in South Korea. Sources reported that the president and his party felt the heat after visiting a supermarket last month with intentions to promote government efforts to lift financial pressures. Yoon had said less than a dollar for a bundle of green onions is a reasonable price when the actual retail price of the vegetable is three or four times that sum. 
Foreign media outlets said that this made the president appear out of touch amid a lack of real progress to stabilize prices and livelihoods. Corruption allegations have also been a topic of interest overseas. Reuters and Al Jazeera underlined the Dior bag scandal involving the accusation that First Lady Kim Goni broke the law by accepting a Dior bag as a gift. Reuters also mentioned that Yoon faced a backlash after appointing former Defense Minister Lee jong sop as the country's ambassador to Australia while Lee was under a corruption probe. Meanwhile, Al Jazeera pointed out that the main opposition Democratic Party is not free from such issues, with the party's chairman Lee Jae-myung facing corruption charges. And despite escalating tensions on the Korean peninsula, Reuters and AFP reported that North Korea is not a major issue in the election. An expert told the AFP that the widespread public feeling towards North Korea is pity, not fear. Reuters said little change is expected in the diplomatic arena, whatever the result. Choi min Dong, Arirang News. For this year's elections, there are some notable differences. And our Peyunji touches upon some of the interesting factors of this race based on the numbers. The general election is South Korea's biggest political event this year. You might be wondering how it works and what's different in 2024. Let's take a look at the election by the numbers. The voting age in South Korea is 18 after the country lowered the age limit from 19 in December 2019. Citizens born before April 11, 2006 are eligible to vote in this year's general election. This means more than 44 million Koreans will be heading to almost 15,000 polling stations across the country that will be open from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. There, voters will receive two ballot papers. One is to vote for a candidate running for their constituency, and the other is to vote for the party they support for proportional representation seats. This year, the ballot papers for proportional representation seats are the longest ever used in Korea. It's 51.7 centimeters long, as 38 parties have registered to battle over these seats. This is even longer than the last election in 2020, when the ballot paper was over 48 centimeters long, with 35 parties running. Before that, in 2016 and in 2012, the papers were about 30 centimeters. Just as in the 2020 election, the votes will have to be counted by hand, as electronic counters cannot read papers this long. Moving on to the candidates running for individual districts, the average competition rate stands at around 2.8 to 1 this year, the lowest in 39 years. In 2020, the rate was 4.4 to 1. Of the 699 candidates that are registered in 254 districts nationwide, 86% are men, leaving women as an unrepresentative minority. The average age of the candidates is 56.8, two years older than in 2020. Those in their 50s took up nearly half of the candidates, followed by those in their 60s and 40s. The youngest candidate is 28 years old, whereas the oldest is 85 born in 1938. By job, 65% of the candidates were professional politicians, 8% were attorneys, and 5% were professors or educators. Doctors and pharmacists accounted for about 1% of the total. The vote count for this year's election is expected to take about two more hours than usual and will likely have the final results at around 2 a.m. the next day.
Today's election will impact the remainder of the Yoon administration's term. The distribution of seats among parties will determine the trajectory of budget bills and legislation. Our political correspondent Shin ha Young provides insights into things to look out for in this year's elections. After about two weeks of competitive election campaigns, all that remains is the people's choice. The April election comes almost two years after conservative President Yoon suk yeols victory in the 2022 presidential election, where he narrowly defeated Democratic Party's candidate Lee Jae-myung by a margin of 0.73 percent, the smallest margin in South Korean history. For this year's election, the number of seats for elected lawmakers has increased to 254 from 253, with one seat taken from the proportional representation bloc, which dropped to 46 from 47, keeping the total number of lawmakers at the National Assembly at 300. Winning at least 150 of the 300 seats grants the party the power to pass budget bills and various laws. Any party that secures three-fifths or more of the National Assembly members, meaning 180 seats or more, will have strong legislative power, including the ability to fast-track bills. In the 2020 general election, the DP and its satellite party won 180 seats, resulting in a minority government with the UN administration taking office. Obtaining over two-thirds, which is at least 200 National Assembly seats, further strengthens authority, allowing for constitutional amendments, dismissal of legislators, and even the ability to initiate presidential impeachment. As the Yoon administration enters its third year in office, the DP is determined to maintain its dominance to act as a counterbalance to the ruling party and the Yoon administration. For the ruling People Power Party, this year's race is considered crucial because failing to secure a majority could potentially render President Yoon suk yeol a lame dog for the remainder of his term. Eyes are now on how the April election will reshape the political landscape for the next four years, including the remainder of the Yoon administration's term. Shin ha Arirang News. To delve deeper into this year's election, let's now turn to our reporter Song Yujin at Arirang's very own virtual reality studio. Yujin. Well, good evening, Jongmin, and to our viewers who are tuning in, I'm Song Yujin here at Arirang's brand new virtual reality studio. Now, as we wait for that important exit poll data to come, let's first examine some figures that we have at this hour. So starting with how many people voted at this 22nd general election. So here we have data from the National Election Commission. As of 6 p.m., it shows that 64.2% of the nation's eligible voters, that is those who were born on or before April 11th, 2006 cast their ballots this year. Now this figure may change uh, as the time goes by, but as of now, 64.2% of people have voted. Now this translates to out of the more than 44,280,011 eligible voters, more than 28 million went to the polling stations and actually voted. Now let's compare this data with that of the previous general election. So here we have a graph of the nationwide voter turnout of the past five general elections here in Korea. So Starting from 2004, it was 60.6%. We did see a drop to 46.1% in 2008, which experts attribute because at that time it was the honeymoon period for the Lee Myung-bak administration and the weather was really bad. It was raining hard that day. Then we saw the figure rebounding to 54.2% in 2012, 58% in 2016, and up surpassing 60% once again, 66.2% in 2020. And data that we have as of now, as of 6 p.m. Korea time showed that the nationwide voter turnout still went over 60 percent, 64.2 percent. But once again, this figure may change. Now let's first, let's now take a look at the regional voter turnout. In other words, how many people voted region by region? So here we divided Korea into 17 provinces and cities and data that we have as of now, 6 p.m. shows that Sejong city that you see on the center left of Korea showed the highest number of voters going to the voting stations and casting their ballot with six 67.5%. It was followed by the country's Jeollanam-do province located in the very south. 
Now, let's take a look at the hourly voter participation here in the country. So as you know, uh, voting started at 6 a.m. sharp here in Korea time. The first data was announced by the National Election Commission at 7 a.m., recording 1.8%. As you can see from the line graph, we saw a steady increase of the voter turnout between 2 to 3 percentage points. But what's interesting is that we saw the voter turnout, the figure, jumping by almost 35 percentage points at 1 p.m. And that is because, mainly because, because the early voter turnout numbers were reflected from 1 p.m. So it jumped to 53.4 percent and then increasing by two to three percentage points steadily in the afternoon hours with the final data, the latest data that we have as of 6 p.m. Uh, recording 64.2 percent. Now, finally, let's compare this line graph to that of the previous general election. So here we have the 2024 hourly voter turnout in orange and we have that of 2020 in black. So so you can see that some parts of the graphs are overlapping, but in total, what's interesting is that voter turnout for the 2020 election was actually higher than that of this year during the early voting hours. That is until uh, that is from the morning hours. But then we saw the results changing from 1 p.m. Once again, that is uh, highly attributed to the record all time high early voting uh, voter turnout that took place two days in the country from April 5th to April 6th. Now, that's all I have for now on the latest on South Korea's general election 2024. I'll leave the in-depth discussions and analysis to you guys in the studio. Back to you, Tongmin. All right. Thank you, Yujin. And to you, Toyeon. Uh, our Song Yujin just gave a briefing mm -hmm. on the voter turnout. How will the voter turnout impact election results? Right. Generally, there's a myth that higher voter turnout really favors the progressive uh, sectors of the country, the bloc, and the lower if there's a lower vote, voter turnout, the conservatives have the advantage. But that's really a myth from a long time ago. And recently, you know, there's a lot of distribution among the demographics uh, for different parties. So we can't really expect anything too uh, clear just from looking at the voter turnout at the, at the moment. Uh, Professor Ritchie, same question. Uh, how will the voter turnout impact election results? I'm going to give a prediction for you and go out on a limb, and I'm going to say that the party that turns out more voters is going to win the election. So it's important. Um, obviously, you know, j all jokes aside, um, you know, I, I think that your Korea has become much more polarized, uh, you know, as we've moved into the world of social media, of mm -hmm. course, and as, you know, as we've moved into a world where most countries have become more politically polarized. Uh, and so obviously that means that uh, you know, getting your base motivated to come out and vote is more important than it ever has been before because the base is a larger percentage of the total voting bloc and those who are independent or swing voters um, are fewer than before. So I think that's really kind of the main thing. Obviously in Korea, the other thing that's perhaps a little bit uh, idiosyncratic uh, is the degree to which you know, regional identification matters. And so, you know, historically, of course, it's the case that there are you know, regional strongholds uh, in the southeast for the conservatives and in the southwest uh, for the progressives. Uh, and although that's still important, of course, you know, Seoul and the surrounding Gyeonggi province has become much more important. And so now I think so much of the effort, you know, ends up being focused there. And so here where I think it's going to matter is some of these, uh, what they were calling, you know, swing districts, uh, in, notably in Seoul and the Gyeonggi province, the, the sort of the Silicon Belt, uh, uh, Silicon Belt uh, area in Gyeonggi, uh, which is a sort of swing area, the Han River Belt they're talking about with some districts in Seoul that are potential swing areas. Uh, and also uh, in a few other places as well uh, around the country. I think you know, getting the, the turnout in some of those places that are supposed to be closer uh, could make some difference as well. Although, you know, since we don't know what the results are, are yet, um, you know, whether or not the swing voter uh, uh, versus uh, you know, base turnout, uh, what that proportion is going to be in terms of you know, how important it is for, for one side to, to get a victory rather than the other. Mm -hmm. Toyon, tell us a bit more about the voter turnout by region. Uh, what could that mean for the election results tonight? Right. I mean, Professor Ritchie actually kind of touched upon it, but uh, I was looking at the voter turnout by 4 p.m. The that's the last time I saw. And most regions actually already surpassed the previous election by 4 p.m. Uh, slight. But uh, one that saw the, mo the fast, uh, one of the fastest uh, high, uh, rate to surpass last election was Jeollanam-do province, and that's the Democratic P Party of Korea's stronghold. On the other hand, um, the, the, the regions that didn't 
passed the last election, uh, voter turnout rate, rate was Tegu and Gyeongsangbuk-do province. So now these rates really stay within the region because this is a national assembly voting, right? So that's not going to affect, or well, besides the pro proportional seats. Um, but it does show which party has stronger support from their own supporters if you look, if you break down these, the regions. So that's what so far we can kind of tell um, the general, uh, the, the, the degree to the supporters really having, uh, how strong are they supporting these, uh, their, their own parties. Meanwhile, Professor Ritchie, uh, overseas voting has ended with the highest ever turnout rate of 62.8%. Uh, what do you read into this? Uh, I'm going to be honest with you and say that I, I'm not sure how many voters there are uh, that are overseas voters and so to what extent um, they can you know, influence the election one way or another. I suppose I didn't do my homework and as a professor that's embarrassing. Um, but what I do think is that ultimately it's not a significant enough number that you know it's really going to swing the election. I think it's more symbolic uh, and, and you know let's say culturally important in a way. Uh, I think it tells us that you know, we live in a world where uh, even people who now live abroad uh, uh, and don't live uh, in the country of their origin or in the country of their birth uh, still feel connected uh, to their uh, to their ethnic homeland or the, or the place where they were born and raised and, and, and might have moved away. Uh, and so I think that you know this is of course much easier uh, in a world where we have social media. It's much easier in a world where uh, you know we get reports uh, through various different channels and, and whether this be official you know, news channels or from fam family or friends. Uh, so I think that it shows that there's still a connection um, or a growing connection perhaps between overseas Korean uh, and, and Korea itself. Yeah, of course, but I do want to mention that every book matters. Of course. Uh, yeah, of course. And Toyon, the story of this year's election has been seen numerous, like plot twists and turns. Inflation has increased and a walkout by trainee doctors has continued for weeks in the nation. Walk us through some of the sensitive issues that have appeared recently. I mean, where to start, right? There's inflation rate that's um, last month we saw 3.1% on year, uh, considered very uh, high, especially with the grocery prices. Um, and on top of that, like you mentioned, the medical school enro enrollment quota, the government is Expansion. trying to raise that uh, by 2,000 from the current 3,000, uh, around 3,000. So, and the, the walkout has really prolonged and slowed down the nation's medical system. So th these all pose risks especially for the top office and the ruling people par party. Um, on top of this, I think we saw from the previous reports that the, the first lady kind of faced some backlash from her actions in the past, and she hasn't been around in public for since la late last year, right? So these are some of the sensitive things that we saw for that exposed risks for the ruling people par party. On the other hand, the opposition party is not really off the hook either. The chairman of DP, Lee Jae-myung, who's running for Gyeongbi district right now, is facing criminal allegations. Um, we saw that also from the previous reports. And also, the other uh, major, not main, but the opposition party that's running for the proportional seats, the Rebuilding Korea Party's leader, Cho Guk, only has the Supreme Court's decision left to be off the hook. He's he's already um, found guilty from the lower courts. So these are some of the risks that both parties saw that you mentioned are sort of sensitive issues that voters kind of had to see before going to the polls. And Professor Ritchie, North Korea seems to be continuing to develop weapons, but the latest one being uh, a new solid fueled hypersonic ballistic missile. South Korea's Unification Ministry has also warned of the regime continuing attempts to meddle in the elections in the South. Your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, you know, I think that the election meddling by North Korea. Uh, isn't nearly as big a deal as it used to be before. I think it's uh, really a, a very marginal part of uh, what happens in terms of uh, uh, election politics here in South Korea. It's a very marginal part of what North Korea is aiming at too. Uh, and there's some simple reasons for that. And the primary one is, look, for North Korea, it's an uphill battle 
uh, in a huge uphill battle to try to influence voters in Korea through disinformation campaigns or influence operations and things like that. So that's part of it. I think it's just a very minor you know, part of their overall uh, approach towards South Korea. Uh, and in addition to that, they have their own reasons for you know, testing hypersonic you know, solid fuel missiles and all of the other things that they do in terms of developing their arsenal. And frankly speaking, they have other and, for lack of a better term, better things to do, right? They have a relationship that they're trying to build up with Russia. They have a relationship that they're trying to build up with Russia, excuse me, with, uh, with China. Uh, and so I think that, you know, to some degree, this is perhaps not as important as it used to be, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, and certainly back as we get in closer towards the period of the Cold War. Uh, so I really don't think that that's a huge deal. Now, what North Korea does, of course, is a huge deal. The development of these systems matters. The testing of these weapon systems matters. The flagrant violations of international law, all of that matters. And the risk to South Korea and the U.S. and the U.S.-South Korea alliance is real. But I don't really think that in the first place, this is primarily about you know, an, an attempt to meddle in the uh, electoral system and the politics of South Korea. Right. Uh, before I wrap up the part one of our, of our special uh, election coverage, I want to repeat, uh, reiterate that uh, this year's voter turnout uh, turns out to be 64.2 percent. So out of 44 million people, uh, 28 over 28 uh, percent, over 28 million people have cast their ballots. All right. We will be back with exit poll results in a moment after the break. Do stay tuned.